Thank you for joining us for the Hidden Wounds of War Conference. Whether you are here in person or joining us online, we are excited to have you with us. For those of you joining online, questions can be submitted using the Q&A function on your Zoom toolbar. My name is Brent Holmes, and I currently serve as the Acting Director here at the Hauenstein Center for Pres Presidential Studies at Grand Valley State University. As a veteran myself, it is an honor to be affiliated with an organization founded by a legend legendary brother in arms, Colonel Ralph W. Hauenstein. Serving as General Eisenhower's Chief of Intelligence during World War II, Colonel Hauenstein witnessed the atrocities of combat, including being among the first Allied forces into the liberated Dachau concentration camp. I have to think that he would be very proud of the commitment of the Hauenstein Center and Grand Valley State University that it extends to those who have served our communities and our nation. The Hidden Moons of War Conference would not be possible without the generous support of our members and donors. We are also grateful for our partners for this conference, Grand Valley's Peter F. Secchia Military and Veterans Resource Center, the Kent County Veterans Service Office, and the West Michigan Veterans Coalition. I would also like to please have the Hidden Moons of War Planning Committee stand. This includes Dr. Bart Beekner, Martha Burkett, Ali Gedicki, Stephen Lipnicki, Cheryl Mankel, Dr. Michael Ryan, Bill Weitzel, and Jill Wolf. Thank you. We couldn't do it without you. And of course, I'd be remiss without thanking the, the staff of the Hounstein Center. Uh, you, your behind the scenes work makes this all possible. To, today's program will include a morning and afternoon keynote along with breakout sessions. After the morning breakout session, you'll be released for lunch. Lunch will be provided in the X Hall right outside this auditorium. For those attending for social work CEUs, the sessions that have been approved for credit are annotated with an asterisk in the program. Th those specific sessions will be conducted right here in Lucemore Auditorium. I now have the honor of introducing Dr. Michael Ryan. Dr. Ryan is part of the original team that spearheaded the development of what is now the Hidden Wounds of War Conference. Dr. Ryan's career as a psychologist spans over 30 plus years. He has a diverse background working in higher education and serving as a consultant for the Air Force Academy, Harvard's Department of Neurology, the Michigan Department of Rehabilitation, and the Governor of Michigan. Please help me welcome Dr. Michael Ryan. Well, my job today is to kind of tell you where we've been and what direction we're going in. This conference really started um, in 2003 at a Christmas party. Uh, I won't talk about how much we'd had to drink. Uh, <laughs> but um, I was sitting there with a good friend of mine, um, Carolyn Schroeder, Schroeder um, and we were talking about the men and women who'd been deployed to Iraq. There were 300,000 of them. Um, at that point, and we both had an interest in trauma and PTSD. Um, Carolyn, because her father had been a Marine who served in World War II in the Pacific um, stage and suffered from very significant PTSD, but she really didn't realize it till later. She was a social worker. And myself, because I'm a neuropsychologist and I've always been fascinated by the effect that trauma has on our brains. Um, and what we realized and talked about was, given the number of um, people who were being deployed, we were going to have a huge flood of people with PTSD, and this is our estimates of the percentages were much lower than it turned out that, you know, to be. Um, and in fact, no, to my knowledge, no healthcare system really was set up to deal with that many people in crisis and struggling. So we decided we were going to try to do something about it. Um, and we started by um, contacting the VA, see whether we could volunteer or there's some way we could help them. And at that point, they thought they had it all taken care of. And you know the story on that. <laughs> um, so, but they really didn't need our help or didn't think they needed our help. So we started doing research and what we found is one of the greatest impediments for our, our, our troops was the stigma around PTSD. 
this idea that if you suffered from this, you somehow you were weak or you were a coward. So we decided to try to put together a conference, an informational conference, um, not only to help people understand the symptoms of PTSD, but help them understand that this is a real is injury. Um, you know, and very, sometimes the most courageous people who are out there and being the most successful on the battlefield, when they come home, end up with this condition. So we approached um, Gleaves Whitney, who was the um, director of the Hallenstein Center at that point, and Gleaves had a huge commitment to our veterans, um, partially because his mentor, you know, had been a veteran and so important. So we ended up putting our putting on our first conference in 2008, if I'm not mistaken, and kind of the central piece, there are two central pieces. One was Carolyn. She, um, after her father died, she reached out to the Marines who were in his unit and just started talking to them. And being a very gifted social worker, they talked to her <laughs> about their feelings, what had happened, and she was amazed at the number of these men who had PTSD and had been suffering for 40 years. And um, growing up, these were the men, um, the, the soldiers in World War II, who were my heroes. And I think for most of us, these men were incredible. They fought for our, our freedom, men and women, but um, and then they came home and helped build an incredible country. But it turned out that many of these men, and she mostly talked to men, um, were suffering from tremendous symptoms of PTSD, particularly at night. In the day, they would be lawyers and accountants and dentists and, you know, um, were very successful. But at night, the symptoms would really hit them. Um, and so a large part of that conference was just Carolyn telling their stories which were very moving. I also um, talked about the physiology of trauma and again, how this is a real physical condition. Uh, it's an invisible one, but um, it's very real. So our first conference was called The Shock of War and the Trauma of Peace. In addition to our presentations, we had a, a fabulous presentation by um, Jim Hodges, who, um, let's see, there's Carolyn with some of her father's you know, friends. Is she still alive? Yes, she is. She is. She, unfortunately, she couldn't make it today, so. But she, I think she'd be very proud of what we've been able to do. Big pardon? Where does she live? She lives here in Grand Rapids. But Jim um, was a Vietnam vet, um, tremendous soldier. He ended up being stuck in Laos for, for a while um, and had to find his way out. And his stories were amazing, and his story about how he helped himself recover from PTSD was very, very moving. And actually, Jim has come back a couple times and helped us with this conference. Um, the conference was such a success that, again, we continued. We were able to um, enlist many great people, which I'll talk a little bit about. But probably um, the most influential was uh, a chaplain, Colonel Herman Kaiser, um, who c came to us, oh, I think in uh, 2013 or so, and just had a huge impact on us. First, he... Um, was such an incredible human being, um, a fabulous clinician, a man. Um, he had two Purple Hearts. Um, he'd been in Vietnam. And he had two Purple Hearts because unlike a, most of the um, chaplains, he would go in country with his men um, and serve them on the battlefield, which put him at risk. Um, so he knew... PTSD and the trauma firsthand, um, and his commitment to his men and women, and particularly to the women in the services, was just incredible. Um, he, 
he was one of the early pioneers in, a, in what's called moral injury, um, which I think is an, a critical concept. Um, and we're this one of the things we've often included in our conferences. Um, and just a great guy to work with. I mean, just um, when he died a couple of years ago, it was a huge loss, and we really remember him. Um, in addition, uh, to Colonel um, Kaiser, you know, some of the key people um, in the past have been Gleaves Whitney, who was very, very supportive. Um, Elena Bridges, Stephen Lips Lipnicki, um, William Busby, and Mark Gleason uh, were all very, very helpful in this process. And then you got a chance to see the today's board. And it's just the people who I've worked with over the years have just been a, a joy to work with. It's This is one of my favorite things. And it's I, I love it when I get to meet you guys, too. So that's the history. The future, and at least right now, has to do with expanding um, the, um, I guess, the, the people that we want to help in terms of having PTSD. And what occurred to us as a board was that in addition to veterans, um, with COVID and some other things that are going on, our first responders, our nurses, our doctors, our medical folks are experiencing trauma. It's a little different, but the frustration, the chaos, the helplessness, those are all stresses, and the, they're risking their lives for us. Um, and oftentimes without getting the recognition they deserve. So we wanted to expand it this year, and I suspect periodically we'll come back and touch on this, um, really to help the whole community. I think it's, it's our duty for these people who are so brave um, and put themselves in harm's way in many, many different ways, not only physically, but psychologically and spiritually. Um, as a community, I think it's essential that we support them, understand what's going on, and, and give them every um, possible um, help we can think of. So I thank you for um, coming today, and I look, really look forward to this conference. Thank you very much. I'll give you again back to Brent. Thank you, Dr. Ryan, and, and uh, all that you've done to, to make this conference a success. <clears throat> Dr. William Nash is a clinical psychiatrist at the VA Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System, a consultant to the UCLA Prevention Center of Excellence, where he developed training for professional well-being and a consultant to the United Nations, where he currently leads the development and implementation of a program to prevent PTSD in global peace operations. Previously, he served as the Director of the Psychological Health for the United States Marine Corps. And while on active duty in the United States Navy, was awarded the Bronze Star for his service as a combat stress control psychiatrist embedded with the 5th Marine Regimental Combat Team in Iraq during the Second Battle of Fallujah. The Doctrine for Maintaining Psychological Health in Military Operations, written by Captain Nash in 2009, still informs leadership training throughout the Navy and Marine Corps. His peer-reviewed research with Marine infantrymen was the first to document PTSD in service members as a direct result of violations of moral expectations. Dr. Nash has co-authored two books, Combat Stress Injury, The Theory Research and Management and Adaptive, Dis and Adaptive Disclosure, A New Treatment for Military Trauma, Loss, and Moral Injury. Please join me in welcoming Dr. William Nash. Well, thank you, Brent, for that great introduction, and thank you even more, all of you, for inviting me to your beautiful city. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to have this conversation. I uh, appreciate that. I got to tell you, it's been, uh, I've done a lot of webinars over the last couple years, but this is the first time I've been in front of a live audience since before the pandemic. <laughs> wow, <laughs> I forgot how scary it is. <laughs> So this is uh, my disclaimers. I have no financial interest. I don't make money off of anything I'm going to talk to you about. Um, 
I will be criticizing certain popular models for understanding trauma and treating it. Um, I don't mean anyone ill will. And if I hurt anyone's feelings by any of my criticisms, I'm sorry. This is what we're going to do today in my two keynotes. This morning, we're going to build a biopsychosocial spiritual understanding of stress, stress injuries, and stress illnesses. The reason for that is because we need to have this understanding so that this afternoon we can construct valid systems and evidence-based interventions for prevention and treatment. So this morning, uh, we're going to spend some time talking about stress biology. I totally agree. Uh, trauma is first and last biological. This is why it's universal. doesn't only occur in certain cultures. It ha it's everyone is vulnerable to this. We're going to use some social psychology, which is uh, a form of psychology that's more popular in Europe than here in the United States and also appeal to some of her sisters, which is industrial organizational psychology and moral psychology. We're not gonna to use too much cognitive psychology though, but I'm gonna to explain to you all the, at various points why that doesn't fit in this model. We're gonna talk about Heinz Kohut's models of uh, self psychology uh, and use social psychiatry to pull it all together. We'll talk about this afternoon, this afternoon. Okay, this is why we're here. Our problem is that certain occupations are at elevated risk for stress, injuries, and illnesses. And I have some definitions here, these are mine. Stress injury is an enduring harm caused by so psychosocial stressor challenges that are too intense or too long lasting. Stress illness is a physical or mental disorder directly resulting from a stress injury. And the big, the big ones we're most concerned about here are complex PTSD and burnout. So I have listed here some uniform and non-uniformed occupations that we now know are at elevated risk for trauma and PTSD. We have uniform occupations, military, police, firefighting, security, EMTs, corrections, but they're also non-uniformed personnel, healthcare providers, social services, teachers, principals, chaplains. So let me ask you this. What do these occupations have in common? Anybody? Say it louder. Yes, they deal with people. They are responsible for the welfare of other people in sometimes impossible situations. That's what, what makes all of these occupations vulnerable. Just so you know, I'm not making this up. Um, these are a couple of tables of, of uh, prevalence of PTSD. This is from the United Nations uh, study conducted last year on PTSD and peace operations. Uh, just the, there are only three points I want to make from these two tables. The top one is base rates of PTSD in various populations. So, and on the left side in red are the actual prevalence rates. So, Active police, 3.9%. Active military in the U.S., men and women, 3. Point. So the first point I want to make is how similar these numbers are in different populations, different occupations, different parts of the world, right? 2 to 4% is the base rate in these uniform populations. That's Now, the bottom table is the rates of PTSD in deployers, in people who have deployed to a peace or combat operation. So the main thing here is the numbers are bigger, five to 8% instead of two to 4%. What does that mean? If you 
if you survey people who've been deployed and they have a higher rate of PTSD than just the general population, what does that tell you about deployment? It tells you that it's a risk factor, right? The second, the, the last thing I want to bring to your attention about this prevalence issue is differences between men and women. So you notice in the upper table, the um, bottom two rows, Canadian study, um, active military women in Canadian forces had a prevalence of 3.3%, but Canadian men only had 2.2%. Similarly, in the bottom table, following deployment, the US Millennium Cohort Study, which is Jacobson et al. here and here, so military men deployed to combat had a rate of 6.1%. Military women deployed to combat, 6.7%. Now the beauty of this study, this is Millennium Cohort Study, where they follow tens of thousands of service members since the turn of the millennium. What they did here is they took, look, it's exactly the same number of people. They, they matched a group of women and a group of men that were identical in every way, including what they did in theater, except for gender, to see what was the difference. So why do women have a slightly higher rate after combat and a slightly higher rate in the population? So one possibility is that women are somehow at greater risk just because they're women. But what these studies have shown convincingly is that the only difference between men and women is women are at much greater risk for sexual assault and harassment, which is a horrible stressor, which is a horrible cause for moral injury trauma. That accounts for those differences. If it weren't for that, they would be identical. Okay. This is our enemy. We need to get to know our enemy. Complex trauma. So I've been assembling these six domains. I'm going to go through the six of them starting at 1.30, uh, emotional experience. These uh, are not from DSM. Uh, they're not from ICD, World Health or, But they're, these, these domains are from all sources. The Bible, the Quran, movies, music, in addition to scientific literature. These are the things that come up everywhere in the world as the consequence of trauma. Okay, first, emotional experience. Shame, guilt, anger. The two disorders from which PTSD was created in 1980, rape trauma syndrome and post-Vietnam syndrome, both of those Anger, guilt, and shame were prominent. But it's more than that. It's emotional pain. When you go to the emergency room with a broken leg or something, somebody's going to ask you, what is your pain level on a scale of 1 to 10? But we don't ask about emotional pain. Emotional numbness, loss of compassion and warmth. Actually, I'm convinced that what this represents is a shift in the set, set point of your emotional experience. Just like a fever is a shift in the set point of your body temperature. This is a moral fever that people, so before the trauma, your baseline at rest might be zero on the scale of pleasure to pain emotionally. But now after the trauma, your baseline is in the negative range all the time. So it's really hard to get those feelings of love and awe and joy and much more of the negative emotions. We're going to explain how that happens later. Okay, number two is relationships. And these first two domains are the primary symptoms. And this is, starts the cascade, which causes all the other life damage. So the second one Loss of trust, severed ties, alienation, feeling contaminated, unforgivability. 
Then there are changes in the concept of self in the world. I have three shattered assumptions here that I no longer believe I'm a good person, I no longer believe the world is a good place, and I no longer believe life has meaning. And I'm gonna to explain to you a little bit where those come from. <clears throat> so, connection to the transcendent. Ever since Vietnam, uh, many have studied uh, changes in faith and religious practice after exposure to trauma, and certainly many people have a loss of faith, a loss of relationship, loss of that personal relationship with God, which is so fundamental to many people's existence because of a loss of trust and loss of membership in a faith community, which can also be devastating. This one here is the hardest to manage but the most important to manage, loss of authority over oneself. These are all biological symptoms and intrusive recollections, the nightmares, dissociation. We're gonna talk about dissociation because that's really central to trauma as well. Panic or rage attacks, obsessions, compulsions, destructive impulses, loss of the ability to relax. And finally, Changes in continuity over time. Uh, the famous developmental psychologist Eric Erickson coined the term identity crisis. And many people use that term now when they're talking about adolescence and the challenges of figuring out who you're going to be when you grow up and that kind of thing. Well, Eric Erickson coined that term when he was treating World War II veterans in New York, right after the end of the war. And what he wrote in his first book was that what had happened to these men, mostly, is they had lost the person they used to be. And they didn't know who they were anymore. Because every, all the assumptions on which their previous self were based were gone. They were starting from scratch in their 20s. Oops. All right, so let's talk about stress. Now, the next many slides here, we're gonna zero in on, okay, what causes those six domains of symptoms? What are the changes inside of a person that make those things happen? And we're gonna begin with stress biology. All right, stress, is the response of any living organism to any demand or challenge. Stressor is the specific demand. And psychosocial stress, which is stress generated by interactions with social systems, in the 21st century is 90 plus percent of all human stress, right? Because we, we no longer mostly have to worry about our next meal, or where we're gonna sleep tonight. We don't have to worry about being eaten by lions, but we do have to worry about money, job, family, all those things. Use stress is constructive stress. It's necessary. It's the only way we get better at anything. It's the only way we accomplish anything. If we never got out of bed, we wouldn't have these problems, but we would, we would be useless. But stress clearly is a major risk factor for many physical and mental disorders. And the predominant theory for how that works for mental disorders is the stress diathesis model. It's the most widely accepted uh, meta theory. And that says that mental illness is caused by some combination of stress and vulnerability. And we're gonna test this model here and see how much of the outcome is caused by the stress and how much is caused by a pre-existing vulnerability. Okay. General adaptation syndrome is changes in performance over time after exposure to an intense stressor. This was developed by Hans Selye, who wrote this paper 
published in Nature in 1936, after he did these experiments as endocrinologist. He was the first one to really understand what is now central to st stress biology. And this is how it works. So the vertical axis, this is improved performance. This is decremented performance over time. All right, stressor onset. Performance initially worsens until the organism can mount the alarm and get resources mobilized and then <laughs> performance improves. But all of these activating alarm signals are dangerous and damaging to the organism. And if they're not held in check, they, they do harm, damage, and can kill you. So you have to mount a resistance to the alarm. Now, this sequence makes it look like first there's the alarm, then that stops, and then the resistance takes over as a separate thing. But actually, they're simultaneous. You may remember when you were learning to drive, people told you never drive with one foot on the accelerator and the other foot on the brake, right? That just wears out the car. But that's what happens in human beings is the alarm signal and the resistance signal are going on at the same time trying to balance each other out. These are the mediators. Alarm is sympathetic nervous system in the body. Corticotropin releasing factor in the body and the brain, which leads to cortisol from the adrenal glands. And these are the neurotransmitters for alarm. Adrenaline, epinephrine, uh, noradrenaline or norepinephrine, and dopamine. These are the same neurotransmitters that got stimulated this morning when you had your coffee. Not, not as bad as with a stressor alarm. Resistance is mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system. And by the way, one of the crucial findings of stress biology research and trauma has been that the major malfunction in this balance over time is that the parasympathetic nervous system gets weaker and weaker. So it's less able to mount that resistance. The mediators are acetylcholine, which is the major neurotransmitter in the parasympathetic nervous system. In the brain, gamma amino butyric acid, GABA, Endocannabinoids, this is a brand new area of research, just the last couple decades, realizing this is like the most prevalent receptor in the, in the nervous system, the same ones that cannabis attached to, and endorphins. I remember when I was in Iraq in 04, 05, uh, in Camp Blue Diamond, which is a little sliver of land along the Euphrates and the canal. And we had incoming indirect fire every day. And the beginning of my seven month deployment, I reacted pretty intensely to every explosion and something near me. But I remember almost toward the end of my seven months, I was sitting in the chow hall, which is this little prefab building with paper thin walls and eating a burger and sitting across from me was uh, a Blackwater uh, uh, civilian, you know, contractor. So this is, these are the, you know, civilian warriors, Blackwater, the paras parachutes on the shirt. And we're sitting there eating and a rocket strikes the ground just outside the building, close enough so it showered the prefab metal walls with gravel and debris but not enough to blow it down. So boom, shh, and everybody's on the deck, except for me and the Blackwater guy. And we're both sitting there eating our burgers. There's no way I could have done that at the beginning. And I realized that's endorphins. Over time, they make you more and more kind of like you don't give a shit anymore. In fact, <laughs> General Mattis, who was the first Marine Division commander when I deployed, he had posted signs all over El Anbar province that said complacency kills because he realized that 
The further you get into the deployment, the more you're impaired because of things like endorphins. And in fact, one of the great utilities of this curve is this is, this is so Selye studied this in animals in a lab with very intense stressors. He would freeze them and do things to them, toxins. But actually, this is a plan for any response to any part of you, to any stress. So this could be your day. This could be your week. This is why we don't work seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Because you get exhausted eventually, and recovery is only possible if you can rest, set down the load. So one way, so this curve could also be well-being over the course of a deployment. Your well-being is lowest at the very beginning and at the very end. And being the 1st Marine Division psychiatrist forward during the Second Battle of Fallujah, I can tell you that our rates of stress casualties was this curve turned upside down. Imagine this is flipped 180. So this is an upward bump, and this is an upward bump, and this is a downward line. So the highest rates of stress casualties were at the very beginning and the very end of the deployment. So this is the normal situation. The other point I want to make about this, and I didn't realize this until I made this slide for, for you guys today, is all of the mediators of resistance are targets of abusable drugs and behaviors. Food, sex, nicotine, alcohol, cannabis, opiates. So people who have a problem with substance abuse have a problem with stress. And they're using substances because it enhances their ability to resist the stress. And without those things, they fall apart, right? So if we want to do something about substance abuse, God damn it, we've got to do something about stress. So Selye was excited about this general adaptation syndrome model because he wanted to know what caused stress illnesses. And he was convinced that stress illnesses are all caused by the failure of this process in some way. So how can this process fail? Let's do a thought experiment. Let's pretend that I ask each of you to put your arm out, either arm, uh, horizontal, hand open, palm up. Close your eyes. Because I'm going to drop a three pound dumbbell into your hand. Your eyes are closed, so you're not going to know when it hits until you feel it. And your instructions are, Hold your hand as level as you possibly can for as long as you can, okay? Your arm will trace this curve over time, right? When the weight hits your hand, a little boom, downward blip, then you hold it up for as long as you can, and then so after a while, you run out of gas, right? So, in that experiment, how could we harm you? What could I do that would actually tear muscle? One option is instead of a three pound weight, what if I dropped a 30 pound weight or a 300 pound weight, right? Too much, too intense. You cannot resist something that strong. So that's the first way. The second way is what if the dumbbell is only three pounds but it's covered with crazy glue and you cannot put it down. What happens then? So that's stress lasts too long. Those are the two boundary conditions that lead to stress illness. Okay, so this is when stressor challenges are too intense, there is no resistance phase. You cannot resist because it's overwhelming by definition. What makes it overwhelming is a whole other issue we're going to talk about, but this is the important thing. And you have acute stress and then later PTSD.
this uh, very complicated picture. You don't need to worry yourself about it too much, but I will explain the basics of it. This is a model hypothesis. This has never been tested for psychological trauma, although this model is known to exist for other problems like seizures and strokes and traumatic brain injury. And I, I'm convinced it works for trauma too. So this is how, this is the situation. Certain neurons in your central nervous system run on glutamate as the neurotransmitter and use a particular subset of receptors called NMDA receptors, N-methyl D-aspartate receptors. These specific neurons are unique in your in, in, in existence in animals in that they are the most plastic, the most sensitive to the environment, the quickest to learn and adapt. And because of that, we use these neurons everywhere where we need a lot of computing power. Prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, cochlea in the inner ear, and retina of the eye. Can the inner, can the cochlea, can the inner ear be damaged by excessive noise? Hell yeah! The top two uh, reasons for disability compensation for veterans are tinnitus and PTSD. Both damage to glutamate receptors that use NMDA. What about the retina? If you look at the sun, could that damage your retina? Hell yeah! So the way it works is this. So we have a presynaptic neuron up here, a postsynaptic neuron down here. These orange things are the NMDA receptors, and these purple stars are glutamate uh, molecules. So glutamate is released from the presynaptic neuron, binds with the NMDA receptor, and when it binds, it opens up the pore that before the glutamate arrived, was plugged with a magnesium ion, plugging that opening. But when the glutamate attaches to the receptor, it opens up the pore, the magnesium ion is ejected, and that opens up the pore for calcium to flow into the cell. The more calcium that flows into the cell, the more likely it is that the cell will die either because of apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, basically suicide of the cell. You know, if you've heard that we replace most of our body cells every 30 days, the only reason you don't get bigger and bigger every 30 days is because those cells replace others that die. And they die intentionally to make room for the new ones. So that's apoptosis. That's mediated by mitochondria. It's something we're gonna learn more about in the future. All of us, it's a brand new area of research. But also, the calcium uh, changes the charge and the osmotic pressure inside the neuron, and when enough calcium flows in there, it bursts. And if that bursting neuron happens to be a glutamate neuron, which means it's full of glutamate, what happens then? All the glutamate that's in that neuron spills out onto all the other neurons around it, causing them to be overexcited and burst, which is like popcorn, boom, 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 boom. So this is a model, a possible explanation for acute stress symptoms and dissociation, which we're gonna talk more about. Okay, here's the other boundary condition, the other way that this general adaptation syndrome can be defeated is if the stressor challenges last too long, there's no recovery, and this damages cells, organs, and organisms. And this damage is what we now call allostatic load. Let me explain to you what that means. It's not that complicated. So, the top row, homeostasis, if we begin with a condition where our stress load is way in, 
exceeding our resources to cope with that stress, then we have, we've no longer in harmony and balance, we've lost homeostasis. We can regain that original balance, that's what homeostasis means, restoring the original balance. We can do that only by reducing the stress or increasing the resources. That's homeostasis. But what if we can't reduce the stress? What if we can't augment our resources? Then the only thing, the only way your body can manage that is allostasis, which is balance restored not by reducing the stress or increasing resources, but by shifting the set point, the fulcrum. And this is this shifting of the set point. Um, this is done, the work of Bruce McEwen, he's the guru of allostasis and allostatic load. He calls this recalibrations. But shifting of set points, this is, this is fever, obesity, diabetes is shifting a set point in body sugar, blood sugar. So this is a very common process that we don't understand very well. But it's, it, it's harmful. You cannot stay in this state forever, right? It causes harm. And the harm that allostasis cause, causes is called allostatic load. This is even more uh, complicated. This is from Bruce McEwen, his most recent uh, paper on this issue, and where he s reviews the science linking psychosocial stressors of across the top, you know, adverse childhood experiences, discrimination, job strain, low socioeconomic status, uh, social isolation, blah, 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 leads to disease risk, accelerated aging, et cetera, through these mechanisms all mediated by the mitochondria, which are emerging as master uh, modulators in every cell of your body. So this is how allostatic allostasis works and the mechanisms by which it leads to aging. So. You're not gonna, from this slide, be able to understand that process. I just want you to know somebody has a way to understand how it works, and it, it, and it, and it seems to happen. Okay. All right, so we've, we know that you can be damaged by stress that's too intense or too long-lasting. But do we need a vulnerability as well? in order to get a mental illness? Or is the stress load by itself enough? So I've listed here potential vulnerability factors, genetics, personality, adverse childhood experiences, blah, blah, blah. So fortunately, we do have a way to test this. And we do it by reviewing risk factor studies. Here are three meta-analyses of risk factor studies for PTSD. Bruin et al. 2000, Ozer et al. 2003, and Jouet et al. 2015. And I have listed here the top few risk factors from each meta-analysis, broken down by whether they're pre-event, peri-event, or post-event. Now, the thing about uh, meta-analyses is it allows uh, for greater understanding of the genuine risk, for example, for a problem like PTSD by comparing studies that are comparable. And they're comparable because they measure the similar thing in a similar uh, population and they report effect sizes, which is crucial crucial. So if people say adverse childhood experiences are a risk factor for mental illness later in, in life, okay, with what effect size? Say in another way, if I have 
a mental illness as an adult, and I had adverse childhood experiences, what percent of my current problems can be explained as a result of those early life experiences? Flip that on its head, if I didn't have those early life experiences, how much less would be my risk? And you only can do that with effect sizes. So I have two different kinds of effect sizes. R squared, which is the portion of the outcome predicted by each variable. R is correlation, co correlation coefficient. If you square it, that gives you a relative weight. That's not mine. And here, the Jouet et al. study used odds ratios, which is also an effect size, but with a little different meaning. That means how much risk is multiplied by each variable. So the odds ratio of 2.3 means your risk for getting PTSD is 2.3 times greater than if you didn't have that risk factor. So I have highlighted in blue the strongest the greatest, the highest risk factor in each study. Notice that they're peri-event and post-event, not pre-event. Let's look at these pre-event effect sizes, adverse childhood experiences, R squared of 0.04. That means that from combining 77 studies, with tens of thousands of participants, the amount of the outcome that is explained by adverse childhood experience is 4%. That's nothing. In fact, uh, our agreed upon threshold for significance is 5%, right? P less than 0.05. So, that, so a 4% prevalence is basically noise. If you didn't have childhood experiences, you'd have 4% less risk, which is, you know, and if your risk for PTSD is, say, 5% risk is 1 out of 20, so uh, multiply that, it's not a lot. I'm not going to do the math. All right, gender, childhood abuse. Now, I'm not saying that adverse childhood experiences are not a huge risk factor for other illnesses but not for trauma. This is key. This is fundamental. You do not need to have any pre-existing vulnerability to get adult onset PTSD, which validates the basic idea that it is broken by life, not going into a situation already broken. And I'm gonna show you some more of that. Lack of social support, discharge a weapon, and peritraumatic dissociation. We're gonna talk more about that. So what's missing from these lists of risk factors? Two that I put on my previous slide as potential uh, vulnerability factors are genetics and personality. Well, if anyone tells you that PTSD is caused by genes, they're lying. I, uh, when we did the marine resiliency study, I'm gonna to talk to you about more of that in a second. We, uh, we got DNA and RNA on 2,600 Marines that we followed over the course longitudinally over an entire deployment. And we contributed their DNA and RNA along with many other uh, researchers to do what is called a, a genome-wide association study. So there were, I don't know how many tens of thousands of samples there were uh, looking for some signal, some correlation between genes and outcome. Nada, nada. Personality. People who, who study personality, one of the predominant models is the five-factor model of personality. One of the five traits that they believe is consistent over time is what they call neuroticism, which if you look at the definition of neuroticism, it's exactly the same as my six domains of complex trauma. 
so, and they don't control for that. So if you take a personality test as an adult and you have some of that negative moral emotions and impulsivity and poor self-esteem, low trust, the test will say, ah, you have a neurotic personality. But they didn't ask you if you were traumatized. So you don't know that those aren't symptoms of trauma. So when you remove that, because it doesn't mean anything without controlling for that, you end up with no signal. So it's caused by stress and stress alone. So risk factor studies, meta-analyses are great, but they're retrospective and cross-sectional. So it's not as useful as something that's longitudinal over time where you measure the risk before they're exposed to trauma. So because of that, I convinced the Marine Corps to give us four battalions of infantry Marines to study over the course of an entire deployment and figure out, find out who got PTSD and who didn't and why, what were the greatest risk factors. So only one of our four battalions had enough combat exposure. Uh, this was in Afghanistan in 2010, which is a very bad time there for the Marines. So we used this as our primary battalion for this analysis, 867 infantry Marines, and we measured their PTSD symptom level using CAPS, clinician administered scale, pre-deployment, one month post, three months post, and eight months post. Now you, and we ended up with, we used a statistical technique called growth mixture modeling, which means instead of imposing your pre-existing opinion about how, what, what patterns should emerge, you let the data do it. You let the computer program look for patterns, look for what kind of goes together. And with that technique, we found that the best fit for the data was three trajectory groups. We had one group, the most prevalent, 79% in blue, that started out at very low symptoms, had a slight rise, and, but went back to very low. So this is, uh, what do we call these guys? Uh, we called them low stable symptoms. 79%. There's another group here in red, 8%, that already had PTSD before they deployed. Now, conventional wisdom would say, oh, this is a pre-existing vulnerability, so these people should do horribly. <laughs> but in fact, they got better over time as a group. That's 8%. And then 13% had new onset PTSD. So we knew these people had no PTSD when they started, but now they do, eight months post-deployment. And over here, we look at what were the risk factors correlated most strongly with the new onset PTSD group. And our, here, childhood trauma, 1% relative weight. W is relative weight, it's same as R squared. 1%, that's nothing. Prior life span trauma, 2%. Combat experiences was only 3%. Everybody had combat experiences. So moral injury experiences, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, uh, was much more a better predictor of PTSD. And here was our strongest predictor in this group of risk factors, peritraumatic dissociation. Now this is, we used Charlie Marmer's, uh, who's developed this with police, his peritraumatic dissociative experiences questionnaire, PDEQ, which measures only one form of dissociation, which is cognitive dissociation. And that's where you kind of zone out or feel like you've left your body or like your, you know, derealization, depersonalization, it's all cognitive. That was our strongest predictor using these variables. 
So we need to talk about dissociation. We've got a real problem here. The problem is that we have two competing definitions for what that means. These are from the current APA Dictionary of Psychology and the current DSM-5. Psychologists say, cognitive psychology, dissociation is a defense mechanism that a person uses intentionally, even if unconsciously, to protect themselves from something painful. Psychiatry says dissociation is a disruption or discontinuity in the, in the processing of information in the brain, which can affect consciousness, memory, identity, emotion, perception, body representation, motor control, and behavior. And there's a whole chapter in DSM of dissociative disorders. Those are not due to some kind of defense mechanism. If it's a defense mechanism, it has to be reversible. Right? If you do it intentionally to protect yourself, it cannot harm you, because you wouldn't do it then. So, because of these uncertainties about dissociation and uh, the history of going back to World War I, World War II, shell shock, you know, people who were paralyzed, stuttering, all those uh, somatic dissociation symptoms, we did this. In the Marine Resiliency Study, we generated what we call a paratraumatic behavior questionnaire, which, uh, how many items? 15 items that we drew from the PDEQ, which is cognitive dissociation, paratraumatic distress inventory, which measures things like um, emotional states, anger, fear, guilt, shame, panic, and some metaform dissociation, which are those physical forms of dissociation. And what we came up with was, and this, by the way, was our strongest predictor of PTSD eight months post-deployment of anything we had in the study. We had 900 some variables. And we found there were four different types of peritraumatic dissociation. There's cognitive, like for a period of time, I was confused and had difficulty making sense of what was happening. Number nine, for a period of time, I was disoriented and was uncertain about where I was or what day and time it was. There are also emotional dissociation, such as number two, could barely see it. For a period of time, I felt fearless and invulnerable as if nothing could harm me. Or number six, for a period of time, I was unable to stop laughing, crying, or screaming. There's also moral dissociation for number 12. Nope, that's not it. Number four, oh, number one, for a period of time I didn't act like my normal self. Number four, for a period of time I felt no remorse for doing the things that I was doing. Or number five, for a period of time I was determined to get revenge. There's a very common situation out there, very destructive one. That's dissociation. Or physical dissociation. I couldn't move parts of my body. My speech changed, stuttering, intense physical reactions. These types of dissociation are not only prominent experiences at the moment of trauma, but they also recur then over time during flashbacks and remembrances, many chronic PTSD symptoms are dissociative symptoms. Certainly a flashback is a dissociation. Okay, so what happens when you dissociate? Uh, this, this, is gonna, this is a little bit of a walk here, but if you stay with me, I think it's gonna be worth the, the, the trip. So this is from Paul McLean's work on the evolution of the vertebrate brain. He called it the triune brain because he focused on the top three levels. But I add the shark brain down there at the beginning. And this is how our brains evolved over a half a billion years. Okay. Fish start with just the autonomic nervous system and this little bit of the brain, which is mostly the thalamus and the pituitary gland. And it's this part 
that controls your body and controls your stress response. You don't need the rest of your brain to do those things. This can do that all by itself. Then the next part of our brain that evolved, now the shark has no interest in other sharks other than as food or as potential mates. No social relationships at all. They have no interest. Their only concern is survival. Lizards were the first, certain lizards were the first animals to have social hierarchies. There's the first form of a social uh, system. And one of Paul McLean's greatest achievements was finding out that those dominance and submission behaviors were all hardwired in a certain part of the lizard brain that becomes the nucleus accumbens in humans. This is also where motivation exists, emotional pleasure and pain, uh, compulsions, obsessive compulsive stuff. What does a dragon brain want? What is its morality? It wants one thing only, power. And people who live by power have not advanced beyond the dragon brain. All power What's that? All power corrupts. <laughs> there you go. So then 200 million years ago, the limbic system evolved in mammals, which I call the wolf brain. And that's where moral emotions, as we normally think of them, are hardwired. Morality and love are one. They are the same thing. They're different aspects of the same thing, which is why all mammals have morality. And they've proven this with many, many studies. So do birds. And the fact that birds and mammals both have moral emotions, have the ability for attachment and genuine love. We love our pets because we know they love us. They genuinely do. So this is in the limbic system of the brain. What does the wolf brain want? It wants love, right? It wants to give and receive love. Then there's the angel brain, which is prefrontal cortex, which is conscious thought, volition, planning. I seek truth. So we have four different moralities here, which is why morality is such a complex thing, because you might be in a situation where you're seeking love and the person you're talking to is seeking power, right? <laughs> and you're not having a conversation. So how does, uh, oh, let me advance this here. So evolution gives us, has given us our DNA in codes the capacity to grow these four brains. So evolution gives us that. But we have to, in each of our individual developments, master it. And the way we master it is each of these brains has to tame the one below it, right? So terrible twos is when little kids are all dragon brain. A newborn baby is a toothless shark, right? So development, you have to try to tame each of these brains with the one above it. That's a very difficult process. And development is always a two-way street that under stress, you can regress to earlier states, either temporarily or more permanently if, if there's damage like allostatic load. So my point is, peritraumatic dissociation is very likely an abrupt stress-induced loss of connectivity and control from your conscious brain to the lower parts of your, your brain. Make sense? Okay, I think the last thing I want to tell you about the marine resiliency study 
is the moral injury event scale we also created for the study. Um, we ended up with these nine items. I saw things were morally wrong. I'm troubled by having witnessed other immoral acts, or I acted in ways that violated my own moral code. And we ended up with two, you can't see the colors. These are betrayal by others, betrayal by others, betrayal by myself. So moral injury is a two-sided coin. We have MIO, the top, perpetration by other, moral injury other, someone else betrayed my moral trust, or moral injury self, MIS, I betrayed my own trust. This was a huge, oh, I'm gonna show you the data right now. I should just hold on to this. So this is, uh, well, that's, sorry about the formatting. Um, so this is one company of that one battalion that we I showed you the trajectories for. And for this one company, what we did was we, this vertical scale is percent of maximum score on five measures of stressor exposure. These are five different kinds of stressor. Combat events, getting shot at or returning fire. Aftermath of battle, seeing dead bodies, body parts. Perceived threat, I really thought I was gonna die. Life and family concerns, my wife left me while I deployed. Moral injury events, that scale I just showed you, the only stressor exposure scale that significantly predicted either high symptoms, the red, high PTSD symptoms, sub-threshold symptoms, orange, or low symptoms, yellow. It's the only stressor type that predicted PTSD in our study. Okay, so let's talk about moral injury. What time is it? When, uh, when am I done? Brent? Pardon? 1045, oh, we're good, thank you. Okay, moral injury. So what I'm getting to here is I'm making the case that moral injury is the predominant mechanism of psychological trauma and the main cause for complex PTSD and burnout. And there's increasing data to support that. But now we wanna talk about how does that happen? How is that possible that a betrayal of a moral trust could ruin you biologically so irreversibly? So we're gonna, we're, we're gonna get there. So here are some definitions to start with. This is the definition of trauma from SAMHSA's concept of trauma and trauma-informed care, which I think is a far better definition than anything in DSM. And it's an event that is experienced as emotionally harmful and that has lasting adverse effects on functioning and well-being. Trauma. Moral injury, which is a type of trauma, is enduring harm to a person or community as a direct result of betrayals of moral trust in high stakes situations. I'm gonna show you where that term came from in a minute. Person or community. People are not yet studying moral injury in communities, but it's, it's clear to me that much of what separates healthy communities from unhealthy ones are the collective burden of moral injury. Social identity, a facet of the self developed and maintained in relation to other people, places, and things. And the self, the entirety of one's personal and social identities. Now this figure here is from Marilyn Brewer's 1981 book where she makes the crucial point that social identities are not subdivisions of our global identity. So American cognitive psychologists think only in terms of top-down cognitive control. And so cognitive psychologists will say, well, a social identity is just this room in your cognitive house. But Marilyn Brewer says, no, no, the important thing here is that you know, your personal identity is 
you by yourself, independent of other people. But each of your social identities is an extension of you, a bigger you, caused by growing these new identities in relation to other people, places, and things. This means that identities expand and contract over the course of your lifetime, right? I wonder if the loss of social identities could be a mechanism moral injury trauma. Self-esteem clearly is closely related to the success or failure of your social identities. Moral injury is not a new idea. Our first uh, study to prove that it can cause PTSD was Moral Injury Event Scale in 2013. But the term goes back a ways. So the diagnosis of PTSD was created and uh, published in DSM-3 in 1980. Over the next 14 years, several theorists published important uh, books about theories to understand the nature of trauma. Still, in my mind, the most important. If you're going to only read one book, Judith Herman's Trauma and Recovery. She coined the term complex trauma, complex PTSD. Uh, and her, this is a quote from her book in 92. Traumatic events call into question basic human relationships. They breach the attachments of family, friendship, love, and community. They shatter the construction of the self that is formed and sustained in relation to others. Bingo! Right? That's a home run. Ronnie Janoff Bowman, the same year, published her book on shattered assumptions based on research she had done, very PTSD in various communities, where she tested the extent to which PTSD symptoms correlated with the extent to which these three necessary assumptions were damaged. She's, that's what she called them, necessary assumptions. You cannot live without these assumptions. You have to believe that I am a good person, that the world is a good place, and my life makes sense. Trauma damages those beliefs. Then Jonathan Shea, 94, still a good friend of mine. Uh, moral injury, he coined the term, it's on page 20 of Achilles in Vietnam. Moral injury is an essential part of any combat trauma that leads to lifelong psychological injury. Veterans can usually recover from horror, fear, or grief as long as what's right hasn't been violated. He believes, as do I, that anyone with persistent chronic PTSD has moral injury. Fear you can get over. And there's good evidence for that. You know, there is no animal model for PTSD. People have tried to create one for decades, studying fear response in various animals. But whatever you do to a rat in a laboratory, you can create a fear response in a rat by shocking it. But whatever you do, it goes away in 21 days. It always goes away. There is no chronic stress response like that in animals, which has led, unfortunately, to some people saying, well, it must be then that if humans don't get over a fear response, it must be because they are defective, that there's something wrong with them. And that comes from these two theories. Uh, Patty Resick, 93, uh, cognitive processing therapy, and Edna Foa, 98, prolonged exposure, both studying PTSD and rape victims. This quote here is from the first chapter of Patty Resick's book, the only place I could find where she explains why she thinks cognitive reprocessing is 
appropriate for trauma uh, survivors? She said, so many clients with PTSD have extreme beliefs and have been traumatized repeatedly early in life. So one of the goals of CPT is to teach them flexibility in thinking, to think critically about why the event happened and its implications. That last part about thinking critically about why it happened is addressing the ubiquitous, universal experience of guilt and shame after being raped. And Patty Resick says, that's irrational, you should stop that. Well, we're hardwired to respond that way. And if you look at the way the brain is wired, those emotions are gonna happen whether you want them to or not. Edna Foa, who took a treatment for phobias, exposure, and repurposed it for treating PTSD, assuming that trauma is, is the same as a phobia, there's a problem with that. If you have a phobic fear of spiders, it's likely you were never seriously injured by one, right? If you have a fear of heights, it's likely you never really fell a great distance, right? So that is, it's an irrational fear. But in trauma, something shitty really did happen, right? You didn't make it up. Fear acquisition, this is from Edna Foa's book. So she's, fear acquisition occurs through classical conditioning where a neutral stimulus is paired with an adversive stimulus such that the neutral stimulus then elicits anxiety. Subsequently, through operant conditioning, avoidance behavior is established. So this is a two-factor model of PTSD. The first factor is fear conditioning. The second factor is avoidance. So her thought is the maladaptive coping part of this which is why people don't recover from PTSD, is because they don't let themselves re-experience it enough. They avoid it too much, so they don't get a chance to get desensitized, to get over it. So that's her model of, and both of these, treat, both of these treatments involve trying to correct these maladaptive coping behaviors. So, we've got three people uh, who have theorized some time ago, let me back up, that traumatic events involve damage to a person's identity, social identity, and that the damage is manifested in these shattered assumptions about the worthiness of the self in the world, and that moral injury is somehow at the center of it. So how is that possible? How can a betrayal of a moral trust injure a person's identity? Well, this is my answer to that question. I call this the moral engine model and uh, developed this over the last few years in Los Angeles. It asks the question, what is a person? And the answer is, a person is a moral engine fueled by sustaining emotional attachments. So if you read this left to right across the top, sorry about the formatting, the best you, you can be, contributing to the greater good through love, work, play, and creation, on behalf of people and things you care about. That's what we're here for, people. That's what gives us joy. That's what gives us meaning. That's why we're here today, right? To become a better us so we can better contribute to the greater good on behalf of what we love and care about. So that's, that's not new. We kind of always understood that. The missing piece is this bottom term that this engine is fueled by sustaining emotional attachments, which according to Heinz Kohut, self-psychologist, Chicago, 60s and 70s, come in three flavors, three types 
of sustaining attachments, which he called idealized, mirroring, and, kin or, and uh, twinship. Idealized, I call valued. What I value, who and what I value. Valuing is who values me. And kindred is who do I share an identity with as a brother or sister. I like this picture because it illustrates all three types of sustaining attachments. The valued attachment, someone or something you admire, look up to, want to honor and emulate. So who's, who or what is being honored here? The veterans, the soldiers, the flag. These are valued attachments for us. This is why we have the freaking parade, right? To tell these people how much we value them. Valuing attachments. Who, who in this picture is valuing? Clearly the crowd clapping, right? The music, the whole ambiance, the holiday, valuing. And of course, the kindred attachments, you know, these two or three old farts in the front, these veterans, you know, sharing their old veteran identity, and these soldiers in the back sharing their lockstep soldier identity, right? So those are the three types. Let's look a little more at the characteristics of these sustaining attachments. It's all from Heinz Kohut's work. They are necessary from birth to death. Not just during childhood, but your whole life. You cannot live without sustaining attachments. Anyone who saw Cast Away with Tom Hanks in 2000, you remember Wilson? His soccer ball that he turned into a companion? Why did he do that? Was it because he was lonely? Yeah. But he also did it because he couldn't function without that attachment. He needed that valuing. Val he needed someone to witness. He needed someone to care about. They are necessary from birth to death. Why is solitary confinement so destructive? Why does it kill people? We want each one to last forever. I'm in the process right now of uh, retiring from the VA after four years at LA. I have 400 patients, veterans, uh, male, female, trans, and I'm in the process of saying goodbye to 400 veterans. Uh, very painful, because we all want these to last forever. They evoke positive moral emotions, love and joy. That's how you know it's a sustaining attachment. There's another type of attachment that we're not gonna talk about, uh, are depleting attachments. Attachments that evoke anger or shame or guilt, things about yourself you hate. So you're, Sustaining attachments are your loves. Your depleting attachments are your hates. We choose most of them without knowing why. The heart wants what the heart wants. They always involve a blurring of boundaries, emotional intimacy, shared identity. And sever this is the smoking gun. This is the key finding from Kohut's research treating narcissistic personality disorders is that Whenever a sustaining attachment is removed, it evokes fragmentation and dissociation followed by grief. That's the smoking gun. He found out, he made that connection, that withdrawing a sustaining attachment makes you fall apart, dissociate. And parts of the self become stuck after a broken self-object attachment, which is also central to the problem of complex trauma is that we not only have lost trust in other people's reliability, we lose trust in our own ability to sustain these relationships, and then we, we cannot make those connections again very easily. It takes, it's really hard. Okay, these are just some examples of sustaining attachments in various 
categories just so you get a sense of, you know, and everyone is so unique and different. This afternoon, I'm going to show you a technique for mapping these out as a tool and treatment called moral mapping. But I have them divided up into human, non-human, external and internal. So external human are the people, living people in my life, your life, who you love and who sustain you. People, people outside of you. Non-human are the other things outside of you that are not people that sustain you. Pets, money, way too often. Uh, drugs, alcohol, ways of life. There's a lot of things that go into that. Internal human are people from your past that you have internalized, mentors, parents, teachers, or heroes from myth or whatever that you draw on for strength. And internal non-human, this, this is the fuzziest category, but certainly your own physical abilities and gifts, the things you love about yourself, you know, your strength, your speed, your wit, your whatever, whatever. So to the extent any of those are decremented by trauma, uh, certainly can be a cause for moral injury trauma. Okay, so moral injury as a traumatic loss of sustaining attachments. So here on the left, we have Kohut's, what he called the tripolar self which here's the self, which is overlapping with valuing attachments, valued attachments, and kindred attachments. And this whole thing is you, right? So this, this overlap is key. Because what happens if you lose one of these attachments, an important one? You lose part of yourself. The part of you that only existed in that relationship. The thoughts, the feelings, the behaviors, the common experience that was special for you and that other person, you can no longer have that. It's gone forever. Irreplaceable. And it's the same whether, and this certainly uh, could be because of loss, a person dies or leaves you, but it also can happen by moral injury if it's another external person who betrays your trust, who betrays you, and your reaction is, how could you do this? I believed in you. And now that attachment is gone, and the part of you that only existed in that attachment, that social identity is gone. Could be a kindred attachment, a peer, Military sexual trauma. It also is the same for MIS, which is a little bit harder to understand. How if you betray your own trust, how does that make you lose external attachments or internal attachments? It's because you feel so ashamed for betraying your own moral expectations that you cannot let people value you. Right? You look away. I am not worthy. This, I believe, is the central process to moral injury and to moral injury trauma, complex trauma. And this afternoon, we're going to harness this model as a tool for treatment. Okay, so. This is just fleshing it out a little bit more, that moral injury, a moral betrayal, severs an internal or external sustaining attachment. Either you let down people in your current life or you let down the people inside of you that you look up to, right? My mother, my father would, be, would not be proud of me for this, right? Severs an attachment, the social self is diminished, self-esteem is diminished. How in the world in the 21st century we're not using self-esteem as a measure of anything, as a predictor of anything in mental health boggles my mind? Uh, it's so central. The self's ability to form new attachments is impaired. 
the moral engine sputters and slows, and then the social self diminishes even more. This is my veteran population, homeless, jobless, familyless, uh, you know, diversion program from the courts for God knows what. Because this, this ruins everything that you need to be a human. Hello, everyone. Okay, um, I'm gonna tell you, uh, just to give you a little bit of a brief background. So I'm gonna tell you briefly about Travis Snyder. Uh, Travis is a student at Grand Valley State University. Uh, he was a sergeant in the United States Marine Corps from 2012 to 2018. Uh, at Grand Valley, he's also the president of the Student Veterans Association, um, Student Veterans of America group here. And uh, he's an influencer. Actually, it's better without. And he's a leader. By June 30th, Travis will have cumul cumulatively walked more than 2,000 miles to create awareness about suicide among military members, current and former, while raising funds to support this issue. In his fourth consecutive awareness walk and his second trek around Lake Michigan, this, was, this is actually four years in a row, and this is the second time he's taking on Lake Michigan. Uh, Travis started this walk from Holland on May 1st, and as I speak to you now, he is somewhere between Northport and will be in Sutton's Bay by later today. Hello everybody, Travis Snyder here. I am uh, sharing with you today my trip around Lake Michigan on foot. I am walking about 900 miles around the Great Lake to promote veteran mental health and suicide awareness. This uh, advocacy started just a few years ago, my first trip around Lake Michigan. Um, that was about 810 miles in 42 days. And uh, it all started after my Marine brothers and I lost one of our own to suicide that we served in Afghanistan with. Um, the last few years I've done other smaller adventures to promote the same cause and mission. But um, I'm supporting the Mission 22 organization, which works nationwide to help our veteran brothers and sisters find the help and support that they need. Um, with their mental health um, and to include PTSD, anxiety, depression, suicidal tendencies as well. But uh, this trip will take me about eight weeks to complete. I'll be walking into Northport and uh, maybe at about the 200 mile mark. But uh, so far all is going well. Your support is greatly appreciated. Um, thank you for following this adventure. But if you follow uh, Travis Hikes Lake MI on Instagram and Facebook, um, also on Facebook, search Veteran Mental Health Travis Hikes Lake Michigan. Uh, you will find more information there about uh, this adventure, um, our cause, and what we're looking out to do. Um, but thank you again for your support. It means the world. And uh, much love to you all. Thank you. So if you want to follow along with Travis, by the way, I just, I should have explained ahead of time. He recorded that um, along the way yesterday and he was by the lake. And so that's why you heard the wind. So we made sure we included subtitles because uh, we knew it was gonna be a little bit challenging. Uh, but just so if you wanna trip, just keep an eye on what Travis is doing. Uh, he's just a remarkable gentleman and I just wanted to share his uh, adventure with you. So thank you.